Loving, loving Sairam, Mrs. Kanga Rangatanan, the Sri Satya Sai Global Council of Trinidad and Tobago lovingly welcomes you to the series A Week Unite and Inspire. We are extremely grateful, blessed, happy, and honored that through the grace and blessings of Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba, to have you as our guest on this evening's program. So, Mrs. Kanaga Rangatanan, can you share with us how did you first come into contact with our beloved Mother Sai? First, let me say it's such a joyous occasion for me to talk of our dearly beloved Master, Bhavan Sri Sati Sai Baba. And before I begin, let me put my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our dearly beloved master, Lord Sai, Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, and get his blessings for this interview between me and you, my dear Sai friend. Now, the question that you asked is, how did I come to con into contact with Sai Baba? Let me tell you that nothing in the world happens, not even a blade of grass, not even an atom can move without the divine will. Maybe it was divine will through the voice of Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba that made us think of him in a different, different way. My husband and I in the late latter 30s of our life were completely satisfied with our life, with our jobs, with the four lovely children we had, with all the uh, domestic situations that was around us, we were, we should have been happy. But there was a restlessness that was deep in our hearts, something that all these riches and luxury around us could not satisfy. So we went in search of it. We went into meditation. We went into reading uh, lovely spiritual books by great spiritual masters like Ramana Maharishi and so on of so many people. And when we were reading, we came across by Bahaman's divine grace, a tape suddenly got into our hands and we put the tape and we listened for the first time in the in our lives. Beautiful discourse given by Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, followed by his Sai Bhajans. It touched our heart very deeply, so much so that there was this stirring for us to go and see him and lay our lives under his feet. So, but before going, we wanted to get his background. We read a lot of spiritual books written by Hoffat Murphat, Samuel Sandweiss, and Satyam Sivam Sundaram by Professor Kasturi. We were so eager. We devoured all the books. And it took a preparation of two years for me and my husband to finally think, why not we, with our four children, go and be in the holy presence of this divine master that life has gifted us into our kind of knowledge. So finally we decided, we got all the necessary travel preparations and we went with our children. We went to this beautiful Prashanti Nilayam, the abode of peace, the abode of joy, the abode of eternal rest. There we went, we followed the instructions, and we sat. Uh, it was on the grounds. At that time, we had to sit in the ground round uh, the uh, statue of Lord Ganesha. I was seated with my daughters, and my husband was seated on the other side. And I saw the people were all very deeply, eagerly waiting, involved in writing, Sairam, Sairam on their books, or some were reading spiritual books. That was a time when we were allowed to take books and other things into the holy presence of Swami, not as later time. And suddenly my 
second dog, I was thinking what a blessing it was. And my mind was full of thoughts of the circumstances that led us to come to this beloved master. I was so lost in it that I was not aware of the surroundings. Suddenly my second daughter, she was a 10 year old child. She pulled my sari and she said, mother, look, look there. And I looked at the direction. I saw this radiant glory and grandeur of our Lord Baba coming in his orange robes shedding such a brightness, such a holy brightness that even it dimmed the brightness of the sun above. And that particular uh, incident was the first way we contacted Sai Baba by great divine uh, providence. I won't call it luck. It was divine providence. It was a time that has come, as I said, not even an atom can move without the divine will. It was the divine will that this Ranganathan family from Sri Lanka, from Colombo, should come and lay their lives under the feet of this beloved master. So, my bro dear brother Sai, are you satisfied with the account I gave you uh, by saying how we came into contact with our dearest Lord Bhagavan Sri Sati Sai Baba? Very, very beautiful and inspiring, um, Auntie. And um, could you share what year was that first visit to Prashanti Nilayam? Uh, it was the year 1973. Uh, dear Sai friend, you, you have to understand the antiquity of my age. 72, many of you Sai people, Sai friends, even from my Sai center, wouldn't have been born even. So I am in my early 90s. So I am looking back at a time when my children were very small. And this was the year 1973. And now it is 2023. What a long, long time we have been under his beautiful spiritual glory. Yes, Auntie, that is spanning close to 50 years of knowing him, loving him, and serving him. What a divine privilege and honor. Yeah, thank you. I, I do think that that is one of the greatest blessings, not only for me and my husband, but for my four children who have been led into this spiritual path shown by our dear Swami at a very, very young age. Very, very beautiful and inspiring. So, Auntie, share with us, this is 50 years since you have come to know about the majesty, the glory, and the love of our beloved Mother Sai. You would have had innumerable experiences with Sri Satya Sai Baba. Can you share a few of your most memorable ones with us? Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, since I live far away in Sri Lanka and later on in England and then here in USA ever since uh, 1977, we didn't have that fortune and luck that so many close eye devotees have of living in Prashanti Lilium and working under his divine presence. But still, though distance um, was there. Physical distance was there. But Swami came to us in, in num innumerable ways. And you asked for the memorable experiences that I and my family had. The first set of memorable experiences that I had with Swami was through dreams, through side dreams. Remember, our beloved Master has said, when I appear in dreams, it's not just an ordinary dream. It is a dream where I will myself to come into your vision. You cannot dream of me unless I will myself. Therefore, I consider all these memorable experiences which I'm going to relate to you just now through which he caught us and entrapped us into his beautiful divine net. That is the first, that is the time, or that is the way, that is the method Bhagavan used to catch this Ranganathan family into his fold. 
the first time I remember after reading about Swami, I felt compelled. Um, there was an inner yearning for me to put it down in poetry. I have the habit of couching my deep, deep feelings, these mystical feelings through poetry. So I just sat down at my dining table here in Washington, D.C. And I wrote a beautiful, my first poem for Swami. And my oldest daughter, she said, Mother, last night I had a beautiful dream of Bahaman. He came and he poured a lot of holy ash on the right hand with which you write. What is it? Did you write anything about Swami? I said, yes, that was my first poem about Swami. So the first dream that my daughter, oldest daughter had showed that he was blessing me uh, in coming to his path. And also he used to come in my dreams and initiate mantras to me. He will say, he will give me the meaning of these mystical sounds. And once I was propelled to ask him, Swami, can you tell me whether there is real heaven or hell? He said, no, there is no place, geographical place called heaven or hell. It is all the state of your mind. So that was one dream I had. And then my husband at one point of time, he was working with the World Bank project, a long project in Sumatra, Indonesia. He fell very sick. And I was alone with my children living at the time in London. So one of his Dutch friends who could not even communicate very well in English because he was not fluent, he tried to convey to me that your husband is very serious and uh, we don't know how to take care of him. I was so worried, completely worried with four children, young children in a foreign country like London, not even my own country. And at that time, early next morning, my youngest daughter, whose birthday it was, and I was trying to put her back to sleep, she said, oh, mother, Baba came to me last night in a dream. And he told him, tell your mother not to worry. She even described the sari I wore, my hairdo, everything in detail. And she said, he said, tell your mother not to worry. And she's waiting. Everything will be back to normal. And within two days time, the Dutch friend calls and tells me, I'm going to put your husband into the plane to come to London and be with you for convalescence because he's now better. So these are memorable experiences. And my daughter, second daughter, who is a physician, Swami would come in the dreams and guide her how to be a good doctor. And she was an anesthesiologist. He said, I know it's a case of touch and go. Anesthesia, a lot of life, safety and security of the life depends on you. But don't worry. I will look after you and I'll give you a team to help you for you to look after your patients. So he encouraged her in a choice of, uh, choice of anesthesiology. And in another dream, this is a beautiful dream, where Swami looks like a radiology professor, and he was showing the X-ray of a cancer patient, how the X-ray looked normal with normal lungs. Then after six months, I'm sorry, it looked broken up, the X-ray, the lungs, because of the cancer. And then after six months, he showed X-ray of the same patient, which is very clear and with clear lungs. And then he told my daughter, look, this is the power of prayer. It is the prayer that has cured this man of the lung cancer. And he said, never forget to pray for your patients when you look after your patients. Uh, so Swami appeared in so many ways when her little baby was sick, you know, uh, on ECMO machine, he even gave the phone number of the pediatrician and of the pulmonary um, um, expert and said, go to these people and get their help. And that is what she did. And my son, when he was between two jobs and he was worried, 
Swami said, on such and such a date, you will get the government job, so don't worry about it. So these are memorable experiences that Swami, through dreams, not only for me, but for my each and every member of my family, showed that he is behind us, he is blessing us, and he is made, trying to help us go along the path that he has showed to all his devotees. That is the first set of memorable experiences. The second set of memorable experiences, how can I describe to you? It is the interview that we had. The first time my husband and four children went and sat, he called Swami, Swami called my husband for an interview. He blessed all of us. He produced a nice medallion with Goddess Lakshmi and with the World Bank design on the back of the medallion because my husband worked in the World Bank. And he said, wherever you go, may Goddess Lakshmi be with you. Then in a second interview, another memorable experience, he called my son specially into a special interview and smeared holy ash on all his whole body. And my son comes back stunned and I asked, what is it? He said, oh, Swami put holy ash on my body. And he gave him a medallion and blessed him with a medallion and blessed my daughter, my oldest daughter, for a nice, long, happy future. So these interviews. And then I went with a group from my Sai Center, South Bethesda Sai Center, with a group. And in that one particular visit, Swami gave us three interviews. I sat at his divine lotus holy feet and I watched him doing so many miracles, so many creations and his beautiful words of spiritual advice. Those three interviews, they captured me so much, gave me so much of joy, so much of spiritual rapture that I can never forget it. These are the most memorable experiences. And just before, let me have, this was one of the, this is a close darshan. One day I was seated in Prashanti Niliam. Some of the fate or destiny put me in the front row and Swami came. He was driven in his chair by his close devotees. He stood there and looked at me locked into my eyes and everything around me stopped for me. Nothing but I felt a surge of divine energy coming into me and I was lost in that look of spiritual discharge that he was giving to me. So these are the memorable experiences through dreams and through darshans that Swami had given us which made us believe that he is the Lord who has come to teach humanity how to step out of darkness. I, I hope um, I have conveyed to you, to your satisfaction, some of the memorable experiences that made us grow fonder and fonder of this beloved Guru. Yes, Auntie, that was very, very inspiring and so much of the love and compassion of Mother Sai coming through your dreams and in that beautiful interview that you had. Can you share at least one more of the memorable experiences you've had with him? Uh, well, this was in the interview room. Uh, he called me and my husband privately, personally. That is what he does. First, he gives you a group interview. And then he calls individuals or couples. So we went there, we stood by him. Uh, dear Sai friend, to tell you the truth, at the beginning, in Swami's presence, I used to have a sense of distance and the holy fear. Later on, that dissipated. I felt, over the years, I felt very close to Swami. So when Swami called me, put me on one side and my husband on one side, started talking to us. And he told my husband, uh, you are retired from the World Bank, but I will give you some more work to do. Then 
I, I talked. I was very free to talk with Swami. I had the pictures of my four children. I put it out to him and said, Swami, these are my children. And I won't let him go. I, I had control of the four pictures. So he went on one by one, making his comments on them. He came to the last child and uh, he said, oh, I have chosen a nice bridegroom for her, which happened later on. And I still my, held my hand. He looked at me like a person pleading with me and said, oh, people are waiting for me. Lots of people are waiting for me outside to have my darshan. I need to go. So, so as to say that I should, you know, in a gentle way, he was telling me I was taking quite a bit of time away from all his devotees. I thought that was a very sweet, humble way in which our Lord was pleading with a devotee to give him more time to spend with many other devotees waiting outside. Is that okay? Yes, Andy, that was really, really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. So much of grace and guidance and blessings coming through your dreams and your interviews, both for you, husband and family. And what a unique manifestation of the World Bank on one side of the pendant and uh, the Divine Mother on the other mm -hmm. side, you know? And then you having come to Washington, D.C., and you've lived there for many, many years. It was such a great honor and privilege to visit your home in the month of September and listen to the glories of Mother Sai enunciated by yourself. So, Andy, share with us, what does Sai Baba mean to you today? Oh, dear Sai friend, <laughs> that is a wonderful question because he means everything to me. He is the basis of my life. He is the bedrock of my life. And I try to teach that same feeling to my children, which I happily say the greatest joy for me is that my four children, with uh, the influence that we have had over them regarding Sai, they have dutifully, religiously and happily, they are following Swami's teaching. Yes, he means a lot to us. I consider him as a Purana Avadar as the incarnation of the divine supreme consciousness, the divine energy that makes the whole universe pulsate, the source of life, the source of creation. He himself, as he declared to me primarily, he is the Purana Avadar. He is the divine consciousness that has taken a body to come in order to teach <clears throat> the erring humanity back into the pathways of purity, innocence, and beauty, and serenity. That is how I first consider him. Secondly, I consider him as my guru, as my spiritual guru, who otherwise, if I had not met him, my life would have been a normal life, just a plain life, a life that every other person needs. He freed me, he released me, and showed me the beauty of spirituality and how that is the basis of life. That is the supreme consciousness is the only divine energy that makes the whole world pulsate, which we in our ignorance uh, of this bodily restraints, we cannot understand it. And also as you have, as you very rightfully titled Swami, he is our divine mother. He is the mother, you know, a mother's love for the child is the greatest love in the whole world. Being a mother of four children, I know there is no other love that can be close except divine love. So Swami is not only giving us divine love. He, to me, also takes the role of divine mother. He's a friend to whom when I have problems, I don't think we need to be in his presence because I believe he is everywhere. I speak to him. I write to him. I 
write letters and lay down whenever problems sees me in <laughs> great matter. So I will say that he is not only a divine mother, a divine guru, the, the Purana Avadar, but he is also a divine friend who has helped me out of so many things. And all these things, you know, have been enhanced for me, made it better through my local South Bethesda Science Center, where for years and years, me and my family have gone on Mondays, on Sundays. And, uh, you know, there is a saying, in a Tamil saying, my language is Tamil, which says, a great saint said, Adiyarkum Adiyen. That is, we can be devotee to other devotees. Seeing other devotees of Sai, my heart fills with love. And when I say Sai Ram, it's a joyous greeting that I give to others. So, Swami, you said, what do I think of him? I think of him as a great avadar, Purana avadar. All that also I learned through um, Sai Center, through his teachings, through his books, through the visits that I made to Prashanti Nilayam. Now and then, mostly annually, we used to go. So that is how I consider Sai Baba as the greatest Purana Avadar who has come into the world at a time when darkness is engulfing and light is being put out. So uh, that is the way I consider him as a divine mother, as a spiritual guru, as a Purana Avadar who is not far there distant up in the sky. He is here with us, moving with us very happily in a humble manner. <clears throat> so that is my answer to this question that you asked, what does he mean? He himself has declared that he is the Purana Avadar, not a partial Avadar. He has come with a full pause of the Creator. Yes, Auntie, that was really, really wonderful. How you view him, that he is your mother, father, friend, guru, everything. And uh, it reminded me when you were speaking that you spoke about the love of one mother and he says, I have the love of a thousand mothers. So can we, we can't even gauge the love of one mother, much less for the love of a thousand mothers. And that is why he says, you cannot explain me. You can only benefit from me. But his greatest uh, weapon, you know, when you look at avatars that came before, they had to destroy one or more individuals who stood in the way of the propagation of dharma. But Baba says in this Kali Yuga in which we live, where every single one of us is tainted with evil, if the avatar were to uproot, there will be none left on the face of the earth. So his weapon that he is using of mass, not destruction, but mass transformation is the weapon of divine love. And he says with that love, it will act as a fireman to extinguish the raging fires within our hearts. So love, 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 he says, and all will... Yeah. Well, so that's the hallmark of his teachings. That is the life that he lived and embodied every moment while in the physical form, just radiating love and light in all his activities and all his divine discourses. So, very, yeah. yeah, very true, you know, because in my language, Tamil language, they say, Anbe Sivam, that means love is God, God is love. You are very correct in saying that Swami's main message is the message of the love, not only of the love of a avadar, not only love of, but love of a mother, of a divine mother. Sorry to have interrupted you. Mike, all right, Auntie, such a joy hearing you. And you have, you said you are in your early 90s and you have such a good memory. You have such a good a uh, simple and effective way of expressing what you're feeling that all of us can understand. Oh, that's all Swami's blessings. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andy, 
how has and you have you've been in contact with him through his teachings through the divine interviews through dreams how has practicing the teachings of sai baba transformed and continue to transform your life uh let me tell you when i was young just like other youngsters i was immersed in worldly life i still remember as a teacher you know i started teaching at the age of 19 one of my colleague who was very who was an astrological expert uh, expert of palmistry she said oh show me your palm let me read it and she said you are going to be very involved in spiritual matters i i laughed because 19 years as i was a young as i was immersed in worldly matters i thought how on earth could i be interested i of course had the background of the traditional hinduism beliefs and worship that was given to me by my parents but you are asking how from that point from that state of ignorance and that state of pride of youth i had i changed myself completely completely after meeting swami now swami taught me the first great thing he taught me was what was real divinity you know in my ignorance i used to think like others there is god far above up there in the skies hidden from all of us except to show the visionaries of saints and sages and we have to remain in ignorance that was the ignorant thing i had in my youth though of course my parents taught me the tra- traditional ways of worship in temples but i never had the personal touch but once i met swami i knew what divinity was when one of the american devotees asked swami swami you say you are god are you god he said wait wait you have not listened to the second part of my answer i am god so are you so when he made that statement that made me think of divinity in serious matters divinity does not lie merely in the idols that we worship in the temple divinity is not a far away thing up in the sky or in the depth of caves to be found and searched divinity is within us within each one of us swami taught us that there is this expansive supreme consciousness that pervades the whole universe which is the source of life which is the one that created everything and that each one of us have that depth of consciousness within us deep in our heart i remember he saying why do you stay on the edge of the ocean and cry there are no pearls in the ocean go dive deep and you will find the pearls so through his books prema vahini dhyana vahini jnana vahini he has taught you as well as through his discourses he says that each one has this divinity within us but unfortunately this physical layers hide that brightness that we have and so the first thing i learned from swami was what was real divinity as a result i took up to meditation and and during my time of meditation as it progressed which i did more than almost three times a day i could touch the fringe of that inner happiness that inner peace that inner joy that swami talked about and which is the basis of divinity then swami taught me about love to find unity in diversity and not to see separation or distinction amongst people in whatever form they appear because love is something that binds us all and also he taught me you find your own faults do not find faults in others just like jesus christ said you don't see the speck in your 
eye, but you see the big speck in other people's eyes. So Swami taught me how to think of my faults. And uh, also he encouraged me to increase my spiritual tendency by reading spiritual discourses and moving amongst like-minded people like the satsangs where you can meet the same kind of people. He also taught me to appreciate nature, God's creation, and to see the hand of God in every creation that is all around us and to overcome my negative And also he taught me most of all that service to God, to man is service to God. So as uh, I remember at one time we had, um, we had for seven years in our home, you know, doing uh, service by making sandwiches to the homeless people. And I found joy, my husband found joy, my children found joy in doing that service. So within my scope of physical strength, I love to do service. These are all the beautiful things that our beloved Swami taught me, my husband and my family. Auntie, that was very, very wonderful. And I like what you said, that he has come to awaken the inherent divinity in each and every one of us. So he was telling us that I am God, but you are God also. The only difference is that I know that I am God, whereas you have forgotten your real nature. And that is really the main fundamental purpose of his avatar coming in a human form to show us the way back to ourselves. And that journey happens within. That when we finally arrive, we would have noticed that we've traveled from ourself mm -hmm. back to our true self. That is true. Yes. So that is his divine purpose. And he says that he does that through hooking us, through his love, drawing us to him. Then he begins to cook us <laughs> in terms of the destruction of the ego, the anger, the greed, which all has to go. And then I put in another one called he barbecues us. <laughs> so in that process in that process the ego gets crucified and shattered and then the atma the atmic splendor our true selves then mm -hmm. chance to manifest in those five human values of truth right action peace love and non-violence and then life becomes purposeful we add value and significance to our world and the world of others. Certainly. Yes, yeah, so wonderfully shared, Auntie. Thank you so much for that. And then, Auntie, another question is, if someone were to come to you and says, Auntie, look at the state of the world. Children are disrespecting their parents. There is uh, national wars taking place. There's economic depression, there's poverty. There's so much of debt as a result of the pandemic. People have lost jobs sleeping on the streets. They are poor, hungry. You know, so there's so much of what we might call apparent chaos and misery in the world. The world is crying out for love and for peace. So if someone were to come and state these things to you and then ask you, Andy, what can I do to make the world a little bit more loving, a little bit more kind, a little bit more united, a little bit more peaceful? What would you share with that person? Uh, it's a very hard question of all the questions that you have asked. Uh, looking at the world around, especially the world now, how so many beings human beings are in terrible danger, how there is a lot of enmity, warfare, hatredness, all the things that Swami taught us against. When you see that, 
your heart bleeds in agony, in pain at what the people are suffering. At the same time, Swami has told us, when a question is asked like that, how do we change the world? He said, change yourself first. Become a loving person and be filled with the light of spirituality. I can take care of the world. I am sure the divinity has a purpose. We do not understand it. We are human beings. We do not understand what is the purpose of this useless warfare when so many innocent civilians are killed. When race against race, faith against faith, individual against individual, there is so much of hatredness. So my take on this is we ourselves change ourselves into a perfect person of love and dignity and spirituality as Swami has taught us and trained us. And in doing so, if there are people who are willing to listen to us, not people who want to shut their eyes and ears and mouths, you know, at our teachings. I would like to share certain kind of uh, teachings that Swami has taught us. The first is, if they do find amongst their own faith or their own country, some great spiritual master who is trying to teach them the way of leading a happy life, they should follow that person. Because Swami says these are all different paths. We should never decry the beliefs and faiths of other people. So whatever faiths, whatever belief they have, whatever spiritual teachings they are given by their own spiritual gurus, they should. I will advise them to follow them because there is so much of happiness and joy in following that. Then secondly, I will ask them, to show love to all creations of God, not to look at the garbs that we wear as a different person, different faith, different age, different country, different skin, different so many things. There is so much of differences in which, you know, variety is the spice of life. I'm sure you would have learned that proverb. A garden that has only roses is not beautiful. A garden that has different, different flowers has so much of a beauty. In the same way, God's creations are all different. Different so that variety gives the spice of life, the joy of life. So we should forget the external differences. Look at the internal divine spark, divine light that is within each one of us. And through the outer layers, see that inside layer of purity and sanctity in a person. And I will tell them, please see that and love the people. And then we should try to help others. We should never talk ill of others. Swami beautifully says, even if you can't help people, please desist. Stop from telling negative things of others. Even doing service, he says, if you are not physically fit to do service, at least give positivity, um, give loving feelings towards other people. So I will teach them the most of all is the greatest teaching of Swami, that is love. Love is the basis of life. Love is God. God is love. And it is the supreme consciousness that governs the whole universe is nothing but love the supreme energy, because once you go into meditation and have a just a fringe, a glance at the fringe, what you see there is love, joy, supreme happiness. And also, I will say not to have negative feelings towards others, to educate the future generations in all the best things of life, the best values of life, and do not trust your views on others. Please try to listen to the views of other people and find beauty. All what Swami taught, I will try in my own humble way to pass it not to unwilling listeners, but those who are willing to listen. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about my cough. <laughs>
So that is the best I can do. What Swami taught, I have. I need to share what joy He gave me, what happiness He gave me. I want others to share and enjoy the depth of it. I want to tell them in my own simple way how Swami came along and changed my whole life. My husband's life, my family's life. I cannot imagine what our lives would have been without His divine presence and His spiritual guidance. That is what I like to share to other people. Thank you very much, Auntie. Many, many priceless jewels you've shared there of how to make the world a better place. And then you highlighted something in your sharing that the greatest miracle of Swami is not the manifestation of vibhuti, the materializations of rings and pendants, bringing the dead back to life, multiplying food, uh, and so many other miracles that he has performed, his greatest miracle, he has said, is the inner transformation that takes place within the individual when they are touched and transpired, when they are touched and inspired by his divine love. Can you share a little bit about that transformation? And you, dear friend, I admire the way that you have risen above the limitations of your background, of your religion, and gone to see the universality of Swami's teachings. What a great, great, great service you have done to the whole world. You are showing by your example that your background of faith in which you grew did not put a fence around you. You removed that fence you understood Swami's real spirituality, the oneness of humanity, and you rose above it. Not only did you rise above it, you are here spreading His message. You are doing a wonderful task to rise above the limitations of your own background and become a humble, loving teacher of Swami's, messenger of Swami's teachings. That is the greatest service you are doing. And before you finish, you know, Swami's birthday is coming closer, November 23rd. That is the great day when this great nation is celebrating the Thanksgiving Day. And it is a Thanksgiving Day for all of us Sai devotees. The day when Swami took a human form and put his whole energy into that little human form to teach us. And uh, Sai Lights, the magazine that the Global Council Zone 1 puts out, uh, they requested a poem and I wrote a poem. And if you may permit, I'll just read the last answer of the poem, which sums up the whole message of what we were talking. So I may I have your permission? So, Auntie, before you share that wonderful poem, which I know will be so inspiring, and please share the entire poem. I think it will be very nice to share the entire one. But, Auntie, through Swami's divine prompting, you have written 75 poems on Sai, on the glory of Sai, on the message of Sai, on the love of Sai. How did this happen in your life? Through what medium did these poems come to you through his divine grace? Um, what shall I say? They spontaneously came in my heart. My heart that was filled with joy and love for Swami. Any moment I felt that love, I thought I had to share it with all other Sai devotees. The joy is in sharing, not only in expressing my views, but the joy I get, I want you to get that joy because we are all bound by the love of Swami. And so whenever I feel that love surging within, I need to find expression. And my expression is a poetic expression couched in poetic words. And um, 
whenever they whenever Sai lights uh, that great magazine of uh, uh, the Global Council Zone One invites me. I don't know. I thrust my poems on them <laughs> for the simple purpose. I want everyone to share the joy that I have within me. You know. So before you finish, I can, with your permission, if you permit, I can read it. Please, Auntie. Please go ahead. We would love to hear your beautiful poem. The whole poem? The entire thing. Please share the entire poem with us. Okay. This is the latest poem I sent to uh, the editor of Sai Lights. At thy sacred feet, dear Sai, I find peace and joy. As thy birthday dawns soon, thy advent among us arrives. I marvel at her fortune to have the earthly sojourn just now. At a time when divinity in full form descended in human garb to restore humanity to its native sacred splendor, what a joy. In response to the pleas of sages and saints, to their laments, thou taking pity on us all, seeing darkness encircling humanity, thou came amongst us, loving and guiding us, freeing us fully, Nature rose in joy. Humanity wept in ecstasy to see thy glory. A meritorious past led me and my family to thee years ago. A blessing indeed to be enveloped by thy divine aura always. We sat for thy darshans as we waited with eager devotees. Thy silent gaze locking with mine awakened my dormant soul. In that moment of stillness, unaware of all around, I felt peace, a peace and joy that throbbed in every vein of mine, filling me, thy presence, thy interviews, thy dreams, all these enthralled us. From the 1970s on, we ever found bliss at thy feet. Lost in the miry paths of our worldly life, caught in its trap fully, Enchanted by its outward charm, we were lost in deep darkness. We forgot the trailing clouds of glory whence we sprung. Dear Lord Sai, what a great compassion as thou rescued us all, taught us the fullness of our form and the trick of our thoughts, showed us the path to the real Sai, a true divine spark within, that we are all part of the glory of thy creative divine energy. Dear beloved Sai, let us all rejoice at thy advent this birthday. Uh, thank you for giving me the privilege of sharing this with other people. Andy, that was most inspiring, soulful and elevating. Such beautiful divine words and so many life lessons and qualities that we can pull out of what you've shared, and a truly ideal birthday gift that we can give ourselves as we celebrate very soon the another birth anniversary of this avatar of the age. And as you said, so lucky we are to have recognized him and to have been selected by him to be contemporaries of his divine mission. And I want to tell you that the books that you have given to us with your beautiful poems, we are using them to share on the radio program and share with the SSE children and children of uh, the EHV classes. So the books are being used and are going to continue to be used for the propagation of human values. So we want to thank you very much for sharing these wonderful poems that contain such inspiring messages and basically the human values of our beloved Lord. Oh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about us. I, I have to thank our dear Lord for blessing all of us. And I don't need to say that you're such a wonderful messenger of a dear Lord 
Well, I'm Sri Sati Sai Baba. Continue to be so and spread his love and light amongst all and try to dispel the darkness that is surrounding humanity. That's a great service you are doing, a wonderful service, dear Brother Sai. So, Mrs. Kanaga Rangatanan. Ranganathan. Ranganathan. Yes, Ranganathan. Yeah, and how do you pronounce your name? Fais. Brother Fais. Brother Fais, yes. So the Sri Satya Sai Global Council of Trinidad and Tobago wishes to express gratitude and appreciation to you for taking the time to share your personal journey and transformation at the divine lotus feet of our beloved Mother Sai. It has been a truly inspiring, motivating, and transforming experience. Listening to your experiences and enunciating the glories of Mother Sai. May Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba continue to bless you with good health, with long life, with peace and prosperity, to witness many, many more of his Mahimas, his divine leelas of love as he continues to transform human consciousness. May you continue to be the loving instrument you are in his divine mission. Jai Sairam. Sairam, thank you.